My name is Monk Rowe, and we are filming in San Diego, California at the San Diego Jazz Party, and it's a real pleasure to have bassist Phil Flanagan with me, one of the fine upstate New York jazz musicians on the scene today. But you're one of the few whose name does not end with a vowel, you know. Well, that depends on how many other uh, upstate musicians you're aware of. Well, why don't you fill me in, because there's probably all sorts that I don't know about. Well, the immediate uh, few that come to mind are uh, my contemporaries in Geneva mm -hmm. in the years probably 72 to 74. Um, Michael Hashem, the alto saxophonist, and uh, Chris Flory, the guitarist, uh -huh. also with Scott Hamilton. His original home is Geneva also. And a drummer by the name of John Ellis in New York. Those are just Genevans. And I mean, I've become uh, more aware of other upstaters like Mel Lewis and uh, uh, Lonnie Smith, the organist. And oh. They're from their Buffalo guys. Uh -huh. And then, of course, all the other Italian upstate yeah, guys, right. you know, the, for the Joe Romanos and the right. Scott LaFaros. And the, right. right. Did you get into Rochester much as a kid? Um, fairly close to hear any music in there. You, you end up going to East I, right? I heard Monk at U of R. No kidding. Yeah. Yeah. That's the only time I saw Monk, and it's the only time I saw a concert at U of R. Uh -huh. um, I, th I thought it was great. I think it was probably 1972 or something like mm -hmm. that. Or maybe it's a tad earlier. But, uh, you know, I, I can at least say I saw Monk. Yeah. There's a lot of other guys I, I never having did. been born when I was uh, that I never did get a chance to see. Yeah. What drew you to uh, jazz and the string bass? I mean, you could have gone into, you could have been attracted to uh, rock and roll more than jazz or the electric bass, or did you do all that too? Well, uh, which part of that do you want well, to That was a long <laughs> question, wasn't no, it? No, I, I got it. Um, <laughs> basically, I always liked bass. Hey, that sounds poetic, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> like every other 13 year old in 1969, I took up the guitar because I wanted to be another Pete Townsend or Jimi Hendrix. Mm -hmm. Well, that didn't last long, luckily, because uh, my dad has a very good jazz collection and hung out with Bird a few times and that kind of a thing. So he has a comprehensive Charlie Parker collection, a very good collection of uh, Lester Young and Benny Goodman and Basie and Ellington and on down the line. And, uh, you know, I always heard that music growing up, but when you're 13, it doesn't seem all that important. You know? mm -hmm. uh, it's just environmental. It yeah. wasn't chosen. Uh -huh. So uh, the music I was exposed to with my peers and whatnot in the late 60s, all the, you know, Hendrix and Rock and Beatles and whatever else, uh, that, was, uh, that was a phase I went through with the guitar, but I found I was still playing bass lines on the guitar when I'd get together with a couple of friends and guitar players, they'd play guitar stuff and I'd play bass stuff. So uh -huh. I eventually got an electric bass and that didn't last long and I found a cheap uh, upright and my dad bought it for me. It was only 175 bucks, which is <laughs> right, <not> ridiculous <laughs> by these days. It's like days. a set of strings now, right? Yeah, <laughs> less, less. You can get, to get good gut strings, it's mm. almost $300 a Oof. set. Anyway, uh, so, that, that phase of my uh, musical career didn't last long, luckily, because I discovered that I actually liked, and there was a period when I was about 15 or 16 where I got interested in my dad's collection as, I, as my awareness, musical awareness, sort of expanded a bit from listening to other things, and uh, I discovered Monk Records, and uh, of course, I've known who these people were my whole life, but I, I didn't like make my own research into mm -hmm. it until I was in my mid upper teens. And then it, then it became mine, not just my dad's, you know, and then I, I embraced it. Was your father a musician, an amateur at all? Yeah, yeah, he used to uh, play, he played with the Manjonis at different times, you know, not oh. regularly, just yeah. he has, a, you know, on a couple on of occasions. On what instrument? Uh, clarinet, alto, and tenor. Uh -huh. And uh, he, you know, Worked with a bunch of guys around Geneva, around that Canandaigua, Geneva, Canandaigua, and Samson Air Force Base, and mm -hmm. uh, in the 50s when it was going, and a uh, place called the uh, Club 86, and a holiday bar and grill down in downtown Geneva. Uh, 
Club 86 had a lot of people through there, Coleman Hawkins, Dizzy, and a bunch of people throughout the years. And uh, I'll mention to an older musician that I meet from time to time, you know, did you ever play a place called Club 86? And they went, they go, yeah, upstate New York, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seemed to be on the circuit there wow. for a while. So, uh, you know, my dad's uh, connected with that upstate jazz scene, of which there are others, like uh, Wayne Andre went to the trombonist, uh -huh. went to Sampson, and uh, Donald Byrd was in Sampson. And these guys would go on the weekend. They'd go into Geneva and have parties and jam sessions and whatnot. Yeah. And, uh, but uh, obviously the biggest jazz name out of my hometown was Scott LaFaro. And uh, I guess this isn't really answering your no. question too good, but uh, that's right. I I'm forgot sort of he came from there. Go, yeah, I'm sort of go getting off into. Well, <laughs> I, okay. I I played I played guitar, and then I got interested in bass. Yeah. I got interested in jazz. And then the music came. Right. And then I then my dad told me about Scott LaFaro, who he knew very well, him uh, having come from Geneva, Scott. Yeah. And uh, you know, he showed me the newspaper article the cover page on the uh, the uh, Geneva Times from 1961, uh, July 6th, 1961, where mm -hmm. uh, LaFaro's on the cover. There's his crashed car, you know, and the whole bit. And um, Where did that happen? At Flint, New York, just between on 5 and 20, between mm. uh, Geneva and Canandaigua. Mm. And the tree, I was just there a few months ago. The tree is still there, scarred, sitting in front <laughs> of this little house. Yeah. My, my first lesson, I drove by it. No kidding. Knowing what it was. Yeah. yeah. He just like. He'd been lost up all it. night. He'd, yeah. he'd worked a night with Stan Getz uh, uh -huh. in, I believe, uh, it was either Newport or Lake Placid. I think he had the gig in Newport, which uh, there's recorded uh, evidence with oh. Stan Getz. Uh, I haven't heard it. All you people out there, I'd like to hear it. Right. Uh, and he either stayed up and drove to Geneva or there was another gig a night after uh -huh. that. And then he stayed up all night and drove to Geneva. My dad saw him, blah, 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 and, you know, uh, yeah. didn't accompany him that night. Right. Yeah. Well, he was quite a pioneer of the sort with, on the bass and mm -hmm. his work with, uh, did it affect your own playing? Well, yeah, I mean, I discovered uh, his playing through Hampton Hawes records and Ornette Coleman records and, of course, the Bill Evans stuff not to mention a bunch of others. But, uh, you know, I, I thought, you know, wow, that's, that's a different approach, and I, I really like that. And then I found out my close connection with him, and I was sort of shocked. You know, here I am uh, going to high school, trying to learn how to wail on the bass, and finding out that uh, this pioneer cat was, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm walking the same hallowed halls yeah. and this kind of thing. You know, yeah. I used to visit his grave all the time, and yeah. Well. <laughs> I probably Weird. saw him, you know, I've probably laid eyes on him, but he died when I was five, uh -huh. so I don't recall. Yeah. It's possible that I... Plus, he probably wasn't carrying a bass down no, the street. No, he was <laughs> probably just hanging out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just a guy. Right. Yeah. Uh, ended up at Eastman? Well, I did go to Eastman in for the what? prep program uh -huh. uh, for, I just had theory and, theory class and lessons, two hours every Saturday. Mm-hmm. So that was for two years. So I probably went there a hundred times, or yeah. well, now school years less right. than that, probably eighty times or something for lessons. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I had lessons with Oscar Zimmerman, the uh, principal bassist mm -hmm. with the Rochester Philharmonic, and also the teacher of Ron Carter, among others. I think me and Ron are the only the <laughs> only ones in the bell, really still out there doing it. <laughs> right. yeah. Do you have any desire to uh, to go to Eastman? Well, to get musical time. education, however I could get it, sure. Yeah. Uh -huh. Absolutely. Yeah. And but Zimmerman was the cat. Yeah. He was the cat to go to if you uh -huh. want to, you know, take Basil's. I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, you ended up, uh, what was the first big gig for you? First big gig? Yeah. Hmm. I don't even know, playing with big people, you know, like 280 pounds or something. <laughs> Never mind, sorry, bad joke. Um... Well, that that's tough. I did, I don't have. I don't there, there really. I remember one time in Boston when I was going to school, I did a gig with Tiny Grimes uh -huh. uh, that got televised, and that was funny because a friend of mine broke a table laughing so hard, and we watched it at home. You know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, why was it so funny? 
I don't know, it was just one of those college things. You know, yeah, your buddies right. on TV playing with this old guitar player used to play with Art Tatum. You know, I, I don't know, right. they thought it was funny. Yeah. Well. <laughs> I probably did look pretty funny. Uh-huh. <laughs> and you moved to the Boston area and uh, got re-hooked up with uh, Chris Flory? Well, that's a little bit more complicated than that. Yeah. Um, I went to Boston for a year. Chris had gone to Providence because he already knew Scott Hamilton from high school. So Chris spent some time in Providence and then New York City and then Geneva again. This is mm -hmm. all after his childhood in Geneva. And uh, then I hooked back with him, uh, hooked up back with him in uh, Providence and uh, after my year in Boston because uh, the school wasn't really cutting it for me. I didn't, I wasn't learning what I wanted to learn which was uh, authentic, you know, uh, uh, trial by fire empirical evidence sort of nightly gained on the bandstand type of jazz experience mm -hmm. that's what I was looking for and uh, obviously school is not set up to uh, do that and uh, I had this chance to go down and uh, jam and play with Scott Hamilton who we already knew was you know I mean he was the only guy our age he, he was the same type of creature as we were we were uh, reaction viewed as reactionaries and elitists by our by our peers and contemporaries for being, you know, uh, swing snobs or whatever. No kidding. Y yeah, sure. Because they were into what? Contemporary? More eclectic or, I don't know, just less quality as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> it's, it's, I, it's hard to, to describe exactly what I mean. Uh, were they more into what? Playing modal jazz or Coltrane? Yeah, maybe some yeah. of that and some more pop forms. You yeah. Know. Yeah. And this was uh, what year? Uh, About what year? This would have been 75, I guess. Yeah. Hmm. So I went down to Providence and uh, hung out on the scene with uh, Hamilton a lot. Uh, Chris Flory had a quartet, because Scott already had his own band. He was a great guitar player by the name of Fred Bates. And uh, with Chuck Riggs as well, who mm -hmm. followed him on into New York and everything. And uh, the, we were sort of the two straight ahead or swing based, swing and bebop based uh, jazz bands in Providence. So whatever gigs there were, you know, we would, Scott would get all the good ones, you know, we'd sort of pick up the crumbs. <laughs> yeah. But then uh, they had a major personnel shift toward the end of my days in Providence. They had uh, a big shake up with Room Full of Blues was the, uh, with Duke Robillard on oh, guitar. Yeah. And uh, Preston Hubbard. Uh, well, actually, that's the story. I was living with with a roomfuls baritone player, uh, Doug Schlecht, and uh, uh, there was all this uh, rumbling in the in the band about personnel changes and stuff. And they wanted to get rid of their bass player, and they wanted an upright and all this kind of stuff. So uh, there was talk of me joining Roomful of Blues. So I got all the records that Duke told me to get, all the T-Bone Walker records, and learned all the arrangements and stuff for about a month, and then their big meeting happened. It turned out yeah. that they were going to take Preston Hubbard from Scott, and then I would join Scott's oh. band, which I thought, yeah, that's much better Jeez. anyway. I don't, have to, <laughs> I don't have to play a bunch of blues, you know, <laughs> all night long. You know, I was already yeah. a, a swing and bopper by then. Right. So uh, that was a, a great thing, but only we, I think we did six gigs before yeah. Scott left for New York, and oh. uh, Chuck Riggs and I left for widespread depression up in Brattleboro, Vermont. <laughs> words whether where they were based at the time. Can you explain that? Why spread depression? It's the name of a like yeah. uh, okay. swing and jump band right. from that was based out of Marlboro College. Uh -huh. um, Chuck Riggs and I spent six months there, basically saving some money so we could move to New York. You know, yeah. and that's exactly what we did. And everyone in the band knew it. I remember some <laughs> the, the baritone player was being interviewed, and he's going, "Yeah." They're using this band as a stepping stone. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, you've had it in your head for a while at this point that you you had to get to New York. Sure. You know. Sure. It's unquestionably. Uh huh. Yeah. So much so that the first three weeks that I lived there, I lived in the nurses' residence at Columbia Presbyterian Hospital <laughs> in Fort Washington. Hey, how'd you manage that? <laughs> I don't want to really go into detail about that, <laughs> okay. but it was it was the only option I had to get my foot in the Manhattan door. You know. Yeah. So uh, I did, I just think it's funny, you know, walking past the uh, nurse's station with my bass every night, you know. Wow. The, the little, the little uh, 
like uh, front desk they had. You know, yeah. Because it was like a dormitory. Yeah. Well, good story. You know, years <laughs> later, it makes for a good story. <laughs> well, what the heck? You know, uh, yeah, cracking the New York market to meeting people, getting out, playing jam sessions, uh, mm -hmm. hoping to play a gig and get a good recommendation. Well, that happened because of Roy Eldridge. Oh. Uh, in Scott Hamilton's case, Scott preceded me into New York by about six months. He immediately uh, had a gig at Michael's Pub with Hank Jones, Milt Hinton, uh, himself, and I can't remember who the drummer was. It was somebody great, you know, I can't even remember. It may have been Joe Jones or somebody. Um, or Connie Kay or one yeah. of those. Grady Tate. Gray, those possibly guys. Grady. I, yeah. I, I can't remember who the drummer was. For, for, forgive me, whoever yeah. it was. But uh, uh, so they they warmed up to Scott immediately there because you know that's he's playing music from their era, and nobody has done this. Everyone's been going be up a do be up a do be up a do be up a do for for 25 years before that. You know, going uh, one four ba da 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 and be up a do be up a do. Uh -huh. These are just <laughs> <laughs> these are. <laughs> my ways of trying to make the uh, over academicized music uh, sort of to turn it into an onomatopoeia, if yeah. you will, uh, by see, I can do it too, academia. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, just as uh, the, the ridiculousness of that over studied, under feeling mm -hmm. sort of music. Sure. So uh, they really embraced him because they hadn't heard anybody play a tenor saxophone without John Coltrane in mind for, you know, like mm -hmm. I said, about, well, probably 15, 20 years yeah. prior to that. Yeah. yeah, Coltrane really, like, well, he predominated the scene much as, as Parker did, I guess. Even more so, because uh, when Parker was alive, they didn't have all the schools that, that cranked out a cookie-cutterized uh, viewpoint mm. having to do with what, what's important in the various... Uh, categorized box of music. Uh, generally to academia, they pick it apart and analyze it, and if you do that, there's something with the most detail is going to be the most interesting, so something like Coltrane is the most interesting. Um, I love Coltrane myself, uh, except for the final period, and that's good for what it's good for, but um, most people, like the, this kind of festival that we're at now, uh, it's more traditional, and, you know, I can understand why that is, because like language, uh, jazz has a vocabulary, and the vocabulary that's being spoken on a traditional, uh, in a traditional situation like this, is the vocabulary that is the basic words of the language. Now, you can get very off on a tangent and get into all sorts of technical terms, and that's what Coltrane would be doing. You know, take, taking the basic knowledge and taking it off on a, extrapolating it way out on one tangent or another, and uh, saying, you know, like reporting back what's out there. You mm -hmm. know, and I think that's great. I love that. I mean, there's most of my really favorite artists are guys that have done that to some degree or other. Like Jimmy Rolls, it's way off, it's stylistically way off on a tangent, musically correct, but a little on the obtuse side. You mm -hmm. know, a little on the on the uh, askew sort of thing. Um, getting back to my original point. <laughs> Breaking into New York. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, breaking into New York, well, Roy Eldridge uh, was the other guy besides who I mentioned already that really embraced uh, Scott and us. And uh, because by then we were a sort of band and worked, worked together, you know. Yeah. Uh, we worked at Jilly's. Um, for Jilly Rizzo, you know, Frank's friend. Don't know about that. Oh, you don't know about Jilly's, the club in, in New York. It was big, uh, how shall I say it? Uh, the powerful Italian people would congregate oh. there. Okay. And it was a hangout of Frank's. Uh huh. Frank S. Yes, gotcha. And uh, th those people loved to have a good time, and they, back then, you know, throughout the 40s, 50s, and 60s, they they hired good music. A lot of them. Mm -hmm. You know, they they had good taste in music, yeah. in my opinion. Uh -huh. And uh, we sort of fit into that crowd for a few minutes. You know, uh -huh. that scene was sort of on the way down by the time we got there, 76, yeah. 77. 
But uh, Jilly loved us, and uh, you know, Frank came by a couple of times. You know, it was gratifying to get any, even get some attention, you know, yeah. from these people. Yeah. And uh, a lot of the people in New York surround, you know, a lot of people would listen to these kind of people, and if you were all right with them, then you were okay. And so then you might work at another place like Jimmy Weston's. Mm -hmm. And then you might work at, you know, blah, blah, blah. Not that those kind of affiliations amounted to anything really, but they were tolerant of us and we were tolerant of them and we were all very happy with the arrangement, you know. I, I see it as we could use a little more of that <laughs> these days in the politically yeah. correct, uh, over yeah. bureaucratized, over-administrated scene that we have. Can I ask you what you um, would make in a typical night, a place like that? What I would make? Yeah. No, that's confidential. Okay, no, well, I have No, back then, you know, I remember making 35 bucks a night at Condon's. Uh -huh. I don't remember what we made at the other places. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. I probably forgot it for a good reason. Mm -hmm. It was probably very easy to forget, not yeah. being very significant in the first place. Was it a struggle then, financially, to, oh, yeah. to make it, to sure. stay alive? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. To be able to afford even a, a toilet of an apartment uh -huh. in Manhattan on uh, jazz wages. Yeah. These days, a lot of guys get into doing a variety of things, playing electric, uh, getting a symphony gig, or a pops orchestra gig, or anything like that. Um, I never went that way, partly because I was ignorant that that kind of thing could be done. It mm -hmm. just wasn't, it didn't make sense to me. Uh, I just wouldn't have fit in with that, yeah. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> Uh, that's to me the way I look at it now. That's not out of the question now, mm -hmm. as you know, teaching and, and pontificating like <laughs> I'm doing now is not completely out of the question as much as it seemed to be back then. Yeah, yeah. It's just no. I'm just a player. Well, when the first record date come about? Uh, that was something that Bob Wilbur instigated um, for the Chiroscuro label, and. Uh, it was based, you know, he heard us play in Eddie Condon's and he was blown away that all these young guys, you know, we were all under 25 then, I guess. Mm. Yeah. And uh, uh, we're playing this style music. And uh, so he got a date and he put the, the original quartet, which was without piano, just Florian guitar, Riggs on drums, myself, and Hamilton, and um, with the addition of Wilbur on, on soprano and alto and clarinet. Yeah. Um, but one at a time, thankfully. Yes, yeah. well, that would be a little <laughs> Roland Kirky. Yeah, Roland <laughs> Kirky. Quirky and Kirky. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I wasn't, you know, terrifically, I guess at the time I thought it was okay. But these days, you know, it was typical 70s product with the direct pickup sound into the board and no microphone on the bass. And I didn't, the direct off the guitar and no uh, putting a mic on the amplifier or anything. Mm. It was just a, a cruddy recording and they, you know, all these, uh, the new technologies come out like the pickups and the direct boxes and all this kind of stuff. So they, you know, the techies figure they got to use them. Yeah. You know, but now, now he, you know, all the best recordings were made before that. <sighs> and now, you know, there are a number of people who have uh, had the realization that uh, we should go back there and you'll see some high-end and or good recordings uh, coming out with uh, a more acoustical nature. You know, Christian McBride, for one, records mostly acoustically. I, I don't believe I've ever heard a re record of his that had a direct pickup sound on it. Thank goodness. You know. Bass players seem to be at the mercy of uh, the sound people almost oh. more than anybody. Man, I, I got stories, you know. Yeah. I went into this one session uh, uh, with Butch Miles, the drummer. And this is for uh, Harry Lim, the famous Door Records guy. Yeah. And uh, they had a young ponytailed engineer there. And I had just gotten my new Underwood pickup, which is good for live situations. You know, at the time it seemed like, well, oh, I can play louder now. It's great. Uh, I get in there and we hook it up. We've got a direct sound on the thing and we do a little test track. And I, I said, that's terrible. I mean, the pickup, it's, good. it's a good signal and everything, but I. I hate the sound of it. Could I please have a microphone? Maybe then you could mix the two, at least, or if not, just <laughs> mix the direct out and yeah. leave the microphone, the acoustic bass in. He goes, no, you can't have a microphone. I said, well, what's the matter? Don't you have one? I, I have one. You can use mine. <laughs> and and the, guy, the guy says, no, 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 no. The, that sound you just got, that's what we want. 
we're going to stay with it. I that's said, what well, we want. Right. Yeah. And I said, well, look, you know, that's not my sound. Could we compromise? Could we, you know, I wanted to at least talk about it. He got very abrupt and said, look, buddy, I'm the artist here, and you guys are my tools. And at uh, that point, I realized what I was dealing with, that some little and some guy in, in little uh, sound engineer school had uh, propagandized this poor fellow into believing that. And uh, remember, I could just hear the guy in class saying, now remember, those artists are your tools. You're the real artist when it comes to the making of a recording. Wow. You know? That's priceless. That is a classic statement. Yeah. It's, wow. uh, you can you can not you can be a musician and not have any technical knowledge and and know the serial numbers and and uh, 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 model numbers of all the various different equipment you know like a like an EV twenty and a blah 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 and an AKG uh, forty seven fifty six yeah. you know and get on from there but uh, the engineers may know all that and it's pretty useless data really when you get right down to it if uh, you don't know what you're listening to if you can't recognize mm -hmm. a sound. It and what's simple, a, doesn't what's it? What's appropriate for different musical situations, you know, that that a bass sound should be uh, more authentic for this particular situation you were in than processed. Right. Well. I'm not sure I understand the question. But I, don't, I don't think there was a question there. Uh, yeah, okay. Well, I can go off from there because uh, <laughs> if it's an acoustic bass, it should be acoustic. Yeah. Ding! <laughs> uh, the thing was made with this big piece of wood for a reason. That's so the wood moves the air. Not so that it moves some little piezoelectric invaders that were stuck into the bridge to induce small currents to be amplified later and then have a, a conical paper cone pushing air at an unwilling audience, unwitting and often unwilling <laughs> audience. You know, I mean, I, I don't see why you have to carry around all that wood if you're just gonna pretend it's not there. Mm -hmm. If you're gonna, if you wanna heavily amplify your upright bass, get one of those stick things right. that has no body, that has no, uh, you know, wood plate, if you will, like the top, of a bass, yeah. the part that moves and creates the sound, moves the air. Uh, if you don't have that and you're not using it, why not just admit defeat and play a stick? Play a stick. Do you ever play a stick? Yeah, I have yeah. on a f number of occasions. Yeah. It's very, it's sort of like um, kissing through a screen door mm -hmm. or something like that. Something like that. It's yeah. just, it's a little alien for me. I mean, it, it's different. Uh, I don't, I really don't like it because there's no, there's no shoulder here. So you never have to really go into thumb position. You can, thumb position is this thing, mm -hmm. where you, you're putting the thumb on a string and yeah. fingering up above it. Uh -huh. uh, you don't have to do that because there's no, Nothing you can just go up like this. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, it's terrible, it's a different, entire, really a very different instrument. Isn't it hard to, does it, is it um, can you lean your body against it somehow? They have little struts and things uh, yeah. that you can, you know, collapse for easy storage. And like that. It reminds <laughs> yeah. me of something, you'd, an exercise machine you'd throw under your bed, you know, yeah. this kind of thing. Oh, oh boy. Bob Cranshaw has a good one, though, uh, that he had custom made for him, which is a bass with, a, well, it's a stick, but it's got a more of some, more of a cavity, you know, like a, maybe a shoe box or slightly larger sized piece of wood that's hollow. It has some resonance factor to mm -hmm. it. So the bridge is not just sitting on a block of wood, you know, yeah. or something solid. So it moves a little bit, so it probably sounds better, but it, he's got it hinged, the neck hinged, so he can collapse the neck down. Whoa. Loosen the strings, <laughs> loosen the thing on the neck, collapse it down, and it all fits in a little uh, oh, man, duffel wild. bag size case that you can th bring on an airplane or throw it in the overhead, or I guess probably just check it. Wow. I don't know, I th it's the only one, you know, he's got the only one. It's wild. Does Sonny like it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. You'd have to ask them. So who was who were the um, the other bass players around New York at that time that, that you would go out of your way to go see? To go see? Uh, Slam Stewart. One of my favorite nights of jazz I ever heard was uh, Slam with Illinois Jaquette, mm -hmm. just a quartet setting mm -hmm. at the Village Vanguard. And he didn't use any amp, and he had gut strings on an old K bass, 
a little ribbon microphone out front it sounded great man it's just that was one of my favorite experiences uh -huh. that and any anywhere Milt Hinton was of course right. Vivier was still playing um, uh, George Mraz was on the scene and I used to go see him with I saw him with Zoot a couple of times and uh, uh, basically though if you're uh, a musician you don't get a whole lot of chance to you don't get enough chance to go right. out and hear the people that you like to because usually uh, they're working the same night you are you know I never run into bass players I run into everybody else mm -hmm. on a festival like this I run into two other bass players right. but in a normal day-to-day -day gigging situation you hardly ever run into any mm -hmm. drummers same thing because yeah. there's only one per gig you know where'd you meet uh, Milt I met Milt at Michael's pub in New York uh -huh. I think it was that time um, it was that time when uh, Scott was playing with them that was his one of his first yeah. gigs in New York and I came by and sat in and everything and I think that was the first time I met Milt. Uh -huh. I'd see, it just feels like I've known him forever at this point. Yeah. I, can, I couldn't even, I, that would have to be it. I'm right. sure that was it. Quite a guy. Oh, Maybe. Milt, don't, don't get me started. He's ridiculous. He's, I can't even imagine the way I feel at 41, making it to his age and traipsing around the world with that big unwieldy thing and playing the crap out of it like he does. He does things where he does his slapping thing that I know that no one else in history has been able to do because mm -hmm. I know I've tried to do it and I've showed other people. I show everybody that's, that cares about it. I videotaped it and I've slowed it down because it goes by too fast. He does a note, a, like a slap note, and then a triplet slap, and then a note, a triplet note. Dum, diddle, dum, diddle, dum, diddle, but he can do it. I, know, I saw him do it once when he was 85. It was like at a temple like this. It's, it boggles. Uh -huh. Completely boggling. Yeah. And plus, he and Mona are just such sweethearts. They're yeah. just unbelievably great people. Some people make you feel good when you're around them. Yeah. Oh, you know, get, get, get Milt after the gig some of his stories, boy. Yeah. Boy, that's just, it's like a history book just mm -hmm. opening up, man. It's amazing. Yeah. It's just it's an amazing the, character. Yeah. How long did you stay in New York, and did you get out doing road work with those particular, with Scott, and did some traveling? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I got out of, with uh, Scott quite a bit. I think uh, we didn't work as much as a lot of people thought we did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I remember, I think it was 1978, only the, you know, we'd been there a year and a half or so. We had our best year on the road. I think we did 14 weeks on the road. and. Uh, we never did as much as that, as that again, although we did, you know, ha anywhere from half to two-thirds of that or something uh, for the next, you know, almost ten years. But uh, everyone was relying more and more on, uh, more and more on freelancing yeah. in the New York area and, get, you know, picking up whatever you could on the road with other people. Uh, I started working in duo situations with John Bunch. Uh, that tided me through a whole lot of yeah you know potential poverty and I also got a chance to learn all his stuff and you know just be it's the people that you're around I keep trying to tell guys that are in school <laughs> this that it's it's not you know the book learning and the theoretical knowledge and even the practicing of theoretical knowledge is great but the thing that makes it what it is is the human element and and if you want to if you want to be it, you have to hang around it, and you have to experience it, and it is the people that are doing it. So you got to get out and hang out and get to know the people, you know, mm -hmm. that are, you know, f like whoever, whoever it is that you look up to. In my case, uh, it was the people like Benny Goodman and Roy Eldridge and Maxine Sullivan and Vic Dickinson and Scott Hamilton and Ruby Braff and Kenny DeVern and Bob Wilbur and those kind of people that were... You know, I, some of them I didn't have uh, knowledge of before I moved to town. But once I was on that scene, you know, just from playing gigs with a lot of different people and using my own ears and my own judgment, yeah, I mean, these, these were the people. Yeah. What was it like to play behind uh, Benny Goodman? Great. Great. What could I tell you? I mean, yeah. I, I, he always played good. I mean, 
I've, we've heard all the stories about the Ray and all the yeah. unthinking, care, careless things that he would do, uh, thoughtless things that he would do. And he acted very strange on a, any number of occasions. One uh, time he came out, we were playing the uh, big uh, music hall in uh, Philadelphia, uh, Symphony Hall, I believe it's called. Uh, beautiful place. He comes out. You know, the whole band is on stage. He walks out. Uproarious applause. Applause fades down. He's holding his little clarinet like this. <whistles> Almost like he's testing the acoustics or something. Or, you know. And the whole audience, including the band, is sitting there scratching their heads going, okay. Uh, and this goes on for like a minute and a half, two minutes, right at the beginning of the show. And then finally, he just said, hello, good evening, it's so nice to be here. Where are we anyway? <laughs> but uh, he was, I viewed him as, as sort of a harmless, sort of a talented, uh, idiot savant sort of yeah you know there's a lot of artists like that they're brilliant artists socially inept mm -hmm. uh, just they they don't have a concept of, of that there's even other people in the room much less that they might be aware and might need to be communicated to uh -huh. something basic like that you know yeah. uh, there's 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 a, there's a category of artists like that yeah and I you know I love to witness and absorb and, and, and consume their works. Yeah, be part of it. But it, you don't really want to hang out with them, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know? <laughs> there's, there's some that way. He was one of them. I mean, one, to give you an idea, uh, we were playing in L.A. one time, and um, we were staying at the Ambassador, and uh, Jimmy Rolls was playing, um, I guess it was a solo gig. It may have been Dante's, but I, I think it may have been somewhere else. I can't recall. It was in the early 80s. And uh, a bunch of us, including Scott Hamilton, Warren Mache, and I think probably Cal Collins, and Connie Kay, and those are the kind of people that were in the band at that time, uh, John Bunch. Uh, we went over to, to catch Jimmy. And uh, you know we sat down, and then he finished his set, and he came over. He goes, hey, you know, what are you, all you guys doing in town? You know. Uh, and we go, oh, we're here with Benny. And his response is, does he still sleep with it? <laughs> Meaning his clarinet. Yeah, yeah. Because the guy related to the world through his clarinet. Mm -hmm. And uh, although a lot of people will say, uh, yeah, he was, uh, you know, sly as a fox, you know, mm. strange with a purpose. Oh. You know, but I, I, don't, I don't know if I'd buy that. Yeah. <laughs> I was up pretty close to it. Now. It was, I've been to his it was house. pretty much just strange. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he, he did some things like the, co like the copier scam. The copier that, that, scam. That, that you've heard that well, one. I've read it, but you can tell it. <laughs> well, it's just basically Lawrence Schoenberg is the, uh, the uh, source of this story because he was working for him. He was sort of the secretary and business manager. You know, he would sit at the desk and answer the phone and run out to the drugstore or right. whatever, you know. And uh, he asked uh, Benny to copy some music and he needed some paper and his whole long story. Anyway, uh, Benny made sure that there was three uh, uh, Xerox copier machine outlet places there with three different copiers in his apartment on 66th Street. All because they all, you know, they, he's made a, an American Express card commercial. Everybody knows who Benny Goodman is, yeah. right? So, uh, <laughs> you know, Benny's like, they, they need 60 copies. Is it, well, do you suppose, I, I need a demonstration. Do you suppose you could make 20 copies of this? <laughs> you know, and so he got his 60 <laughs> copies out of the three <laughs> machines as, as samples, you know, and then, he's, yeah. then he looks at Lauren and says, take care of him, will you? And he walks out of the room. In other words, get rid of these guys, you know. <laughs> Oh God! There's some that's a good there's one. some funnier ones, but I don't think I should yeah. get into them here. You know. Right. <laughs> well, I was looking at your your discography uh, list. You've played um, lots and lots of sessions. Do mm. you have any personal favorites? I know the John Bunch duo record got that's, some real nice. That's one of press. my favorites. I mean, I I'd say that that's my best work to date. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, it's hard. I don't, I don't like talking about my own work so much, uh, except from a technical viewpoint. You know, um, artistically, it's uh, it's up to you. But uh, I, I think that one. Mm -hmm. I never was really happy with my sound until fairly recently, which is an interesting What's your, phenomenon. What do you like to see then when you go into a studio now? What do you, you know, if you can tell the engineer exactly what you want, what's it going to be? I want a 60-year-old telefunk and ribbon mic, and that's it. Hmm. I'm not sure ribbon a ribbon mic would. I'm not it's like those big mics they the used big, to use the big for mothers. like the vocalists back, yeah. way back then, you know. Uh -huh. They have the the fattest, warmest sound. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there's a large surface area that vibrates. It's good for low frequencies. It's good for the human voice, uh -huh. and it's good for the human voice-like qualities of string instruments. Sounds good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> what prompted uh, you to move to Florida? Um, I got tired of the New York situation. You know. Uh, Life there is, um, well, it's not a, an, a highly habitable place, let's face it. It's dingy and dark and dank and, you know, you need lots of stimulants just to get by feeling like you're not a caged animal uh -huh. living in this little crystalline structure of boxes that, are, that the humans, you know, walk from box to box all day. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, that just got to me after a while. I just fi figured there was a better quality of life somewhere, and uh, my parents already lived in Florida, so uh, I sort of did the stepping stone thing there again. Stayed with them for about a year. Did and, you have uh, a uh, you have a family now? Yeah. Did you have a family in New York? No, I didn't. Uh, okay. I could never could have afforded. Yeah. I didn't have a car. I didn't have a family. Uh huh. Uh, nothing like that. I mean, I moved out to Fort Lee, New Jersey, to be able to have a car. Because I didn't have to pay for parking out there. I could park on the street out there, but you really have to have a garage in Manhattan. You can't park on the street. It's you're on a schedule just to park, you know. Ah. You know, because there's the alternate side, and, oh. and it's it's free like after be until 7 a.m. And then if you're not working that day, but you have to move your car to the other side of the street. It might take you three hours to find a spot. It's like a job, you know. <laughs> You're just better off having paying your three or four these days probably six seven hundred dollars a month. Oh Lord! And another another rent for your car space. Yeah. You know. Um, I've often thought, you know, like when when we go to a gig in uh, in Utica, we can we can leave uh, you know whatever forty five minutes before the gig and get there and park in front of the place usually. And hmm. I've often wondered, man, what's it like to play a gig in, in, in Manhattan? With if you've got gear and you've got a bass and let's say you've got an amp, I mean, how do you do that? Bless you, monk. Ugh. I don't think anyone else has ever asked me a question like that. It's it's uh, inconvenient to say the least. Uh, lugging an amp and a bass around, uh, it, it'll make you crazy. Because I mean, I had dreams about my bass getting rained on or kicked or stolen or you mm. know all kinds of things. Uh, you become very physically welded to this object, and it's, it's a severe pain, believe me. Yeah. It really is. can be. Did you ever do any of the um, session work in New York before you, you left? You know, like... When you say session work? Well, I guess that means a lot of different things. Jingles or um, just pop dates. No, I never did any of that. I did. Yeah. A, a Dixieland soundtrack for a race course commercial or something like that. Yeah. They played on the local New York uh, TV for a few weeks or months or something mm -hmm. like that. And I did one thing with Warren Vachey um, the last time um, that uh, Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor worked together was a show called Private Lives, oh. Noel Coward's Private Lives. Uh -huh. It was on Broadway for about three weeks in 1983, and uh, we were supposed to be the pit band. It was like a six-piece jazz, well, jazz and sort of chamber jazz little mm -hmm. band, you know, remind of the, the kind of soundtracks they have in those uh, PBS, English PBS, BBC-produced PBS mm -hmm. shows, but without the violin, you know, like yeah. older, you know, th 30s mm -hmm. kind of, 30s style, uh, 
lot of two beat kind of thing. Anyway, we recorded this thing, I guess as sort of a trial uh, to uh, send the producer of the show as uh, they sent us these tunes that they wanted us to play. We arranged them and played them. They wound up using the tape oh, so rather well. than the live band. So I remember I got a check for half what our weekly salary would have been for 11 weeks, I think it was. No, it wasn't three weeks. It was 11 weeks that the show played, either 10 or 11 weeks. That's the only time in my life I've ever gotten checks for work already done, you know, uh -huh. uh, that kind of thing. So that was, that was real nice, but uh, <laughs> that's a whole other world. I don't yeah. know how we landed into that. Warren landed into that somehow. Mm -hmm. There's a whole, I'm sure, crowd of musicians who make their living that way in the, the studio. Oh, by, pits by all means. And, yeah. Oh, yeah. They do financially better than us uh, a lot of the time. Uh huh. Uh, just by the virtue of the fact that it's steady work. It may not pay that great per night or whatever. Mm -hmm. But over the course of the year, they're probably making more than we are because uh, they're working five, six, seven, eight gigs a week. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, the guys that, that were in that show Cats and. Uh, there's several, several other uh, long-running shows in New York with pit bands. You know, they, these guys, they know their parts so well. They play it the same way every night that they're reading magazines, you know, mixing uh, herb formulas and, you know, packing their pipe for the intermission and all this stuff. And then the note comes, and, uh, you know, and, you know, they're reading, reading something and uh, preparing something and then like that and then they you know <laughs> go along with whatever they were doing in chapter six let's see they can five four three two you know and then that's it that it's it's funny to watch these guys yeah. man i don't i don't envy them that because i i'm mentally too restless to uh. i mean i can't even handle a, a, a repeating bass line mm. for more than about eight bars that's agony for me they have to repeat the same thing over and over. It's like talking to you like, like talking to you like, like talking to you like. That gets pretty like boring. Like talking to you like. Thank you very much. This. It's boring. You know, I mean, I mean, ah, you know, that's just. That's, You're on a loop. It's got a flow. Yeah, I know a lot of people that are on loops. You ever know someone on a real short loop? You ever, how long can you take that? Oh. You hang out with a person and. In 10 minutes, you start hearing the same stories over and over again. Mm -hmm. so there, that's a 10-minute loop. Did Hard, you Hardwired <laughs> in, you know. Have you uh, ever had a point in your career thus far where you considered not doing what you do? Yeah, sure. Uh, not like I didn't always know that I should be doing this, uh, but different points where you capitulate Mm -hmm. to existence and the the raw inherently unjust way things are in life you know mm -hmm. I, mean, I should be able to do this all the time and make a whole pile of money and have a whole bunch of friends and like big TVs in my house and throw big parties and all this kind of stuff but it doesn't work out that way and eventually you start thinking well maybe I should maybe what I should really do is get a power hose and spray down the inside of uh, sauerkraut fermenting tanks in, in between season and spray the mold off the uh, wooden planks that comprise the walls of the uh, tank. I have to ask, how do you even know such a thing exists? Well, my dad, uh, my dad <laughs> had a sauerkraut factory okay. in Phelps, New York. All right. Okay. I mean, not that many was, Hey, that was the high school one. That's how I bought my first base amp. My first Ampeg B15. I worked at my dad's factory for about yeah. two and a half weeks, and and I said that's it because I was the boss's kid, and they kept giving me all the hardest stuff to do. Yeah. At least that's the way it looked to me, and I I know I'm not wrong, you know. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, uh, that was just that one. Then in Boston, I buffed floors in the mm -hmm. Prudential Building. Sure. Yeah, and uh, I've sucked rugs. Yeah. And I've done a little of that, and uh, you know. Little well, little that kind of that. stuff helps keep things in perspective, I think. It, it doesn't hurt, uh, except uh, emotionally. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't hurt except 
your very soul, you know. Uh, <laughs> only, only your soul. And only your soul. Oh. That's all. It only takes a big chunk out of that, you know, <laughs> never to be recaptured again. Right. No, I'm just exaggerating. Yeah. But uh, it, no, it, it can, in the right circumstances, if you're the kind of personality who is already too full of themselves and needs a good slap in the face, uh, th that's a good way to get it. But uh, I know a lot of musicians, not a lot, there's a certain cream of jazz people, natural players, and that, that seem to avoid that through cunning or circumstance. And uh, that's fine, you know, the, the, I, I like that. <laughs> I wish I could have done it. <laughs> Let me ask you about these um, <clears throat> jazz parties for a moment. Uh, it's a pretty desirable thing to have on your or on your plate of gigs. Oh yeah, by yeah. all means. Mm -hmm. uh, strictly for the uh, uh, chance to meet people who comprise the jazz audience, that's one thing. But the main thing is uh, the quality of the musicians. You come to a thing like this, you know that everyone you're going to be playing with is uh, at a certain level because you think about it, the, the axiom that a band is only as good as its worst player, which I believe to be true, mm -hmm. uh, th given that, you know, being an accurate uh, axiom, uh, the lowest level of musicianship here is very high, so mm -hmm. you are never in a situation where, you, you know, you just can't get off the ground the kind of things that happen on your own local scene wherever you are and you're working with yeah. people you never even met or you know and a lot of a lot of times don't even have you know the same kinds of records in your collection i mean i did a gig with a a brazilian singer not too long ago and we couldn't communicate Ex even tune titles were very hard to to uh, yeah. get straight uh between his portuguese and my english and uh, you know we settled on a whole bunch of jobim songs and that was fun but he knew a whole bunch of other stuff that you know I just had to play by ear you know wow. I just had to go by you know that's a one chord and a six chord and a four chord and then a three chord you know you had to think you had to default to just like technical ideas rather than I don't know their culture that good you yeah. know I'm not steeped in that culture yeah. I'm not trying to be an exponent of that and it's uh -huh. you know so now if, when he's back on my turf, I take charge. Yeah. When playing some blues or right. or a bebop tune or something, yeah. you know, he would he would take us, you know, play second fiddle. Yeah. Is there a live music scene um, where you live in Florida of any extent? Yeah, uh, it's getting better too. Uh -huh. um, I think the main reason is about a year ago, maybe a little over a year ago, a guy by the name of Bruce Scott started a a, a magazine like one of those small booklet sized magazines styled after the hot house in New York you know that it's a listing it's it's a it's a place where all the listings can appear and the clubs and record companies and mm -hmm. whoever else in the music business whether it be artists or big companies or whatever can advertise whatever it is you know advertise a concert advertise a record advertise promotion for something and uh, it's you know, got a couple articles and a whole bunch of listings and and a bunch of ads. And uh, because of that, now it's possible to see. I mean, the South Florida scene is is spread out in three counties: Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach. So between north, just north of Palm Beach, and south of Miami, that's a that's a big area. So uh, it's hard to you know you would might be aware of one little scene in one town, another in a little town, it all looked very disjointed and fractured. But now, to somebody coming to that area, a tourist coming to that area, can get this one book and see this is happening in South Beach, and this is happening in Fort Lauderdale, and this is happening in Palm Beach County. And it's like a, a sort of like a, a something to keep track of the music yeah. scene as a whole, taking the music scene as a whole, because in my opinion, the problem with music is just like the same problem that we have politically and everything now with everything splitting off into, like cable TV. Instead of having three channels, three ideologies, now we have 27,000 and we have 47 different music categories. And, and, you know, that's what I like about the thing. It's called Heat Beat, mm -hmm. the thing that's styled after the Hot House. Yeah. It's called the Heat Beat, and it contains all the listings for South Florida. And it's just nice to see it all in one place. Gives you an idea that there's a scene there. 
And now with all the different clubs and stuff sort of competing for attention in the heat beat, or, you know, it gives, it gives it a forum. It gives the whole scene as, a, as one whole scene a forum to, like, check each other out. And uh -huh. you know, you, I just imagine, well, their ad wasn't, uh, we're going to do a bigger ad than them next month, uh -huh. and that kind of thing, you know. Yeah. So it's, I think it's healthy for the, for the scene. What other um, good musicians are down in your area? No, Ira Sullivan's down there. Ira Sullivan, there. Duffy Jackson, Eddie Higgins, uh, Eric Allison, uh, Pete Minger. Um, now you got me on the spot, you know, yeah, I'm going well, to have to, okay. you know. Did you ever do that gig at the Bread of Life? Yeah. Remember that place? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I did that a couple of times. Uh-huh. Did it once with Pete Menger and Eddie yeah. Higgins. Yeah. Yeah, Good. yeah it's great. Well, we were down there one time and we went there and well, it no saw longer Iris Sullivan. <laughs> it's gone, you know. It's gone now. It's, yeah. They, oh, um, okay. The, the owner, who is Rich, uh, his name is Richie uh, Gerber. He is Howard Stern's cousin. Mm -hmm. Whoop de doo. Mm -hmm. uh, he's an amateur tenor player, and uh, always had an interest in music, and started having music at, at this health food restaurant that he had. Then he moved to a bigger location, which was the Big Bread of Life, where they just had it's like a natural food supermarket, right? And a one little area where you could maybe eat some of the stuff you had just bought, and in a small stage with an upright piano. And it just makes for a very strange scene musically because, like Eddie Higgins said, you're right in the middle of, of a chorus and you're just about ready to reach the climax and you hear, uh, price check on aisle three, price check. Like that, you know, and it, it can sort of kill the, the momentum of music, you know, that's, that might be happening at that particular time. Yeah. But, but these, are, these are the kinds of things that, that, that the politically correct, very psychologically correctly and nicely appropriate sort of mental attitude that you should have these days would enable you to accept. You sound like a, a person <laughs> who's not totally happy with the way things are going. Well, in a, it, in a well, it, it has ever been thus, I'm sure. But uh -huh. uh, if it really separates the people that are trying to learn something day to day. And those who are floating on something, uh, resting on something, their laurels, the mm -hmm. status quo, or something else, mm -hmm. or their their little paychecks. You know, yeah. I don't know. It's just uh, <laughs> one of my sociologically astute observations. That's all. Is there a racial uh, inequity in the jazz scene today? No. And I'll explain myself. Please do. The jazz scene taken as a total, you got some white racists and you got some black racists, so it all adds up to zero, right? <laughs> yeah. It's like the expanding universe, you know. And there's, <laughs> it all adds up to zero. There's as much going out that way as there is going this way. You add them up, they cancel out. Uh -huh. But um, no, in in all seriousness, jazz and the jazz viewpoint, the jazz perspective, is the one perspective historically speaking now from the early part of this century on up to now, has been the one that I've seen, the one area or discipline or world, jazz world, if you will, that, that uh, has actually really broken down any racial barriers. Now, you may have legislation that claims to have done this and social situations that have claimed to have done this. And there are individuals, of course, that intermarry and this kind of thing and create little zebra children mm -hmm. that are running around and, and uh, controlling the airwaves now because they're, they're, nobody objects to them because they're in between, mm -hmm. which I think is, is silly and funny. It's an interesting thing to watch and I'm sure very politically unpopular for me to say so, mm. but uh, uh, it, it's, no, I, I would say that there's not only because it cancels all itself. It, all, it cancels itself out if, if you were to add it up. Okay. Now you could have total race, you could have 50% racism on this side. Of course, that's a, it's a useless argument. Yeah, there's, there's some racism, but I don't want to pay any attention to it because it's all, you know, it's, it's, it's a moot point. Really, it, how small can your perspective be to, to, to even, it's like the whole Monica Lewinsky thing. Yeah, I, <laughs> you know, are you really that interested in that? That yeah. you're going to spend all that 
think of the money which has been generated between advertising, news people's salaries, and camera crews, and microwave transmitters, and, and all the lawyers. gas, all the gas that's been burned up getting to the scene of of the latest person who said something in a room with other people there about somebody. I heard a great thing on NPR last week. It was a, a reporter did a story about the Mono, Monica Lewinsky thing from the perspective. She turned everyone into fifth graders and said, <laughs> well, Bill said that Monica didn't do this thing. And Monica said that she had, she got a phone call from so-and-so that said, uh, Paula did, and she didn't like it. And, you know, and this kind of, and, and they went through the whole story you know, and and then uh, and then Bill said this, and then and then Kenneth Kenneth Starr Kenneth said, no, you can't do that. And then you know, then he said, I have proof that Monica said that Paula didn't do. You know, and it, it fitted it, great. It fit beautifully. It's just how utterly insane the whole thing is, and and I hope the whole world laughs at us because yeah. we're incredibly mm -hmm. stupid to pay any attention to mm -hmm. it, like we are to racism. Thank yeah. you very much. Okay, good answer. Uh, I understand you're getting into your the school system down where you live, and well, let me give you some background. Jazz a little bit. Yeah, let me give you a little background. About a year or so ago, I started uh, work getting called for these gigs um, by this small organization called the South Florida Jazz and Swing or uh, Society, based in Delray Beach, which is just north of Boca Raton, where I live. Now, there's a whole bunch of retired people. If you look at that area demographically, there's a whole bunch of older folks. Mm -hmm. So you'd think that the, the swing jazz demographic would be there. And sure enough, it is. There's a, a AM radio station there that plays you know, swing and big band hits and Scott Hamilton and Tony Bennett and Rosemary Clooney and that kind of stuff. Uh, so anyway, this thing started out as a record club. These guys would meet as uh, record collectors and play records for each other and I understand that it was 12 guys and then it was 15 guys and then it was 8 guys and then it was 4 guys oh. and then the last few months it was 3 guys and one of the guys out of the 3 guys said this isn't working let's change our operating mm -hmm. basis here and let's start having some live performances so they did and they organized themselves up to the best of their ability which I hate to say now for, in retrospect wasn't much because they didn't know they were a corporation. They didn't know they had to pay taxes. Of course, now that we are an organization, be largely because of the efforts of myself and my wife and our, our one friend, Kurt Stern, who's been uh, instrumental in organizing all mm -hmm. this, with, of course, the help of all these volunteers. We now have a uh, jazz society, South Florida Jazz and Swing, based in Delray Beach, Boca, Boca Del Rey, mm -hmm. the Boca Raton Delray Beach area. Um, the boasts of 580 members, and those are couples. Each membership is for two people, so you do the math. And in the, you know, it was probably 50 people last year this time, or 12, 13 months ago, it was probably mm -hmm. you know 40 or 50 people. And uh, my wife and I are, she's doing the administration, I'm doing the booking, and uh, I'm artistic director and on the program committee and all this kind of stuff. So it's mm -hmm. been interesting. Uh, experience for me to be uh, on a board of directors and uh, booking things yeah. for an organization and playing with many of them but not all of them and um, we do 10 concerts a year and so far we've had people like Tommy Flanagan, uh, Alan Vachey, uh, uh, Johnny Varro's coming next month, we're getting Dick Hyman, um, we had uh, Paul Cohen's big band, Paul Cohen is a lead trumpet player to play with Basie, Dorsey, hmm. Shaw, you, you name it, um, et cetera, et cetera. I think that artists probably like having a musician in the role of uh, doing some of the booking, you know. Who likes it? The artist that you bring in probably makes it well, yeah, pretty good. Yeah, yeah, that's, and I'm finding out that uh, that generally is not the case with these jazz societies. I don't know how many there are in the U.S. now maybe 60 or something, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure of that number. But uh, it seems to me that very few of them have an actual practicing, you know, work-a-day musician uh, making any of the booking yeah. considerations, which is interesting, you know? I mean, I got to hand it to this guy, Kurt Stern, that organized this thing to put me in that position, because my immediate was, position was like that of a, of a union organizer 
we got to get these musicians some more money here. You know? <laughs> this yeah. is ridiculous. You yeah. know, you know, th and it, you know, turn me into, turn me into a Jimmy Hoffa or something <laughs> for the musicians, which is a little strange. You know, seeing myself in that role, but it needed to happen. I mean, uh, the budgets were so low on the initial uh, shows. I, I called them the 500 Club. Oh, <laughs> yeah. You know, right. That's for the whole band. What are we going to do for this? You know. Well, yeah. Well, anyway, I, I did a. They finally gave me a chance to lead a group, and I did a Benny Goodman alumnus band where I put a, the guys I knew that that had ever yeah. worked with Benny together, and we did some Goodman music. And um, you know, about 425 people showed up, which was a lot, maybe twice as good as we thought. And I'm going, wait a minute, the economics of this just start working out, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, everyone in the band is not doing well enough here. Uh -huh. So this guy Kurt uh, said, "Well, why don't you join the board and you be the uh, program committee guy? You, you know, mm -hmm. help make the decisions about the. At least you'll have a voice." And pretty much, I just went ahead and booked everything. Then they yeah. couldn't say anything. Yeah. They couldn't say anything about it. And you know, one guy said, "Well, how come so and so is making so much more than so and so?" And I said, "Well, because you weren't at the last meeting." You know, <laughs> usual political yeah, tactics right. like that. So I'm finding out how these kind of organizations run. You yeah. know, and, uh, you know, having some sort of uh, community responsibility. Mm -hmm. You know, um, been thrust into a position of, uh, of uh, willingly. So yeah, uh, good. Being put in a position where people want to influence my, people want to influence me now. You know, they would say, yeah. don't you think we should add a guitar to that one? Yeah. <laughs> That gets pretty tight. I said, no, no, it's, it's music, remember? <laughs> the charter says it's to promote jazz, you know, to promote music, you know. We're not just having more instruments. <laughs> it musically has to be right, you know. <laughs> so far, you know, uh, I've always, often thought that this consumer uh, uh, market that we have and the way advertisers appeal to consumers is very condescending and insulting. So I just take the attitude that whether it's true or not, your audience can tell the difference. And so you better have your own finely tuned ear, uh, you know, tuned, attuned to the music, the concept that you have of what's going to happen on the stage that month. Mm -hmm. And that you shouldn't let, as artists, you know, you're better off with one viewpoint making that decision than you are with a committee viewpoint. Because the committee is going to just take the original, there won't be any original idea left. Mm -hmm. By the time it gets chopped up and all, everybody has to add their own little alteration yeah. to this. You know, it's, that kind of a dictatorship is better, you know. And you'll notice that the bands have leaders. You know, so Duke Ellington's organization was not democratic; he was a monarch. They all respected, you know, the living daylights out of him, and that's the only reason that worked. Did you mention to me you'd recorded some of your own material recently? Uh, within the last couple of years, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I did, a, I think, seven originals out of 12 uh -huh. on this uh, record I produced. And uh, I wish I'd had a little more money to get a little better sound quality, yeah. but I'm funny that way. Uh, I'm very happy with it as far as at least having created myself an opportunity to do some writing and right. get some good musicians yeah. to play it, you know, good lesser-known known musicians, except for Duffy Jackson, who's the drummer yeah. on it. Yeah. Do you have a copy? I'll give you one. I would love to have one yeah, for our go. archive, actually. Good. Yeah. All right. And um, you're on tonight two or three times? Uh, once. Once? Maybe twice Pretty if easy. Jay Lenhardt insists. Okay. <laughs> and you got to leave for uh, home I'm leaving tomorrow? for home. i got a uh, concert with Dick Hyman. Uh, we got a rehearsal with him Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock. Wow. So I have to leave tomorrow yeah. to be able to make it there somewhere in the middle of the night. This is mm -hmm. on the west coast of Florida. Yeah. And, uh, you know, probably get six or seven hours of sleep and get up and start rehearsing. Yeah. Well, it probably will be a good one with, with Dick Hyman. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting uh, little thing. There's a, we have a repertory orchestra. There's another jazz society in Fort Lauderdale area uh -huh. called the Gold Coast Jazz yeah. Society that used to be booked by a very capable woman named Lee Omley who has since passed away. Mm -hmm. And uh, their board, is a board, you know. They can't seem to decide what their uh, actual thrust is, whether it's music or. Well, I haven't been that. I used to, I used to advise them on some things, but I've been too busy with this other one now. 
anyway, uh, we're doing a concert over there with Dick, and um, uh, there's a guitar player down in South Florida by the name of Simon Saltz who organized a, a either seven or eight piece group, depending on whether we have a baritone sax or not, uh -huh. uh, to do repertory material, jazz repertory. Um, all the old Louis Armstrong things and, uh, you know, some, well, when Dick is the pianist, we, we started out as a local group sponsored by the Gold Coast Jazz Society, so we had the unwieldy name of the Gold Coast Jazz Society Repertory Ensemble Orchestra. Or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Anyway, it's what I call it the the rep work, uh -huh. the repertory orchestra. Yeah. Where we we do you know old stuff, historical jazz. Yeah. You know, and uh, I'll play Jack the Bear, the first bass solo from uh, sure. Jimmy Blanton yeah. and Duke, and and I do a piece called Trigger Fantasy with them, which is um, written by Trigger Trigger, Al Trigger Alpert. Yeah. From uh, he lives in Punta Gorda, Florida now, I think. Sorry, Trigger, if that's not right. Um, a piece that Dick arranged in the 60s for a Riverside record session under Trigger's name. Uh -huh. uh, it does a whole funny story that goes, a, a string of coincidences kind of story that goes mm -hmm. with that, but it's too long for here. But uh, I do that with them, and uh, they do a uh, trumpet feature that Chris LaBarba, a very excellent trumpet player over there, uh, he's like, Mr. Repertory, he can imitate anybody. I mean, he can do Harry James, and he can do Louis, and he can do uh, Roy Eldridge very well, and uh, you know, you name cool. it. And uh, you know, it's it's an interesting thing. So then we add Dick in there. Dick comes out and does all his little stride things and jelly rollisms, and I mean, Dick is the living embodiment of the encyclopedia of jazz yeah. at his fingertips. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there is nobody that has more of that kind of knowledge than Dick Hyman, mm -hmm. and can also play it. Yeah, yeah. So it's always a lot of fun. Yeah. Right. Well, I want to thank you for joining us here. Oh. Any anything I haven't asked you about that you'd like to throw in there on your own? Mm. <laughs> I, I can't really say that uh, I thought we were going to go a little bit more into history. I guess you had the basic, my basic history about going to New York and all that yeah. stuff, and then uh, pretty much I, le yeah, I left New York for Florida, I guess that was eight years ago, and since then I've been uh, trying to be able to live in Florida and have my arms reach out further yeah. into the environment, rather than, you know, in New York you don't need a very long arm, there's people real close. There's yeah, all sorts so of you have to travel quite a bit to yeah. get out yeah, but that's and, okay. And do the work. That's okay. Florida's pretty flat and boring. I like looking at the hills and stuff here. Yeah. Yeah. Different change well, of scenery. Florida's, uh, especially in the summer, can be brutal. Do you get overseas? Yeah, I've been doing Europe two or three times a year, uh, mm -hmm. either with Bob Wilbur or I went over with Frank Vignola, the guitarist. We did a little Django group there a little over a year ago. And uh, who else? Uh, John Coliani, the pianist. Did a trio with Duffy Jackson and, mm -hmm. and the, the three of us. That was funny, man. That's 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 a funny experience. I mean, just being on the road with Duffy. I'll is, bet. There's something right there. I mean, <laughs> it's funny. Very hilarious cats. You know, his father was here yesterday. First time I met him. You know, I've known right. Duffy for years, and I just saw Chubby for the first day yesterday. Yeah. I, I wish he could have hung out a little longer. Yeah. It would have been nice. Yeah. Well, um... The state of jazz for you is uh, pretty productive, you think, for the most part. The state of jazz your, for me? Your involvement in jazz seems to be in a fairly healthy state. Is it, can I say that? Yeah, I, I like that idea. I'm, I'm in agreement with that okay. idea. Um, I have you know all sorts of delusions of grandeur, and I'd like to take it a whole lot farther than I have. Uh, but the album I'm about to give you sometime before I leave, mm -hmm. um, will at least give you a hint of, of, a very slight hint of one of the ways I'd like to take it. Right. But I, I need some kind of firmer foundation beneath me to be able to do something like that. Right. Like, you know, that are a very rich yeah, ba backer, you know, kind yeah. of person. Well, if we, if we use Milt Hinton for a judge, you have another 40 years or so where you can... <laughs> you can can you believe that he was 85 when he had his first record out under his own name on a major label? Oh, man. 85 before he 
they Columbia gave him a date. Yeah. <laughs> now that's one way to look at that. You could look at that as he made a zillion other records where he yeah. didn't. He neither asked nor planned on being the leader. So uh, right. it's it's all how you look at it. I yeah. guess I'm sure he doesn't have any complaints. Right. I will say though that I, I am very grateful for the opportunity that I have coming up in uh, July at the 92nd Street Y, you know those uh, concerts mm -hmm. every July for a week or two. Uh, yeah. Dick Hyman is the musical director of right. the, a concert series at the 92nd Street Y in Manhattan. And uh, he's doing a tribute to Milt this year on one of the nights. Oh, man. And he's going to have a, a piece written by Milt called uh, The Judge and the Jury. I've heard it by two titles, The Judge Meets the Section and The Judge Meets the Jury. Mm -hmm. And uh, on that Columbia release, uh, Laughing at Life, it's yeah. called The Judge and the Jury. And we're going to do that piece, and I'm going to get the Milt Hinton part. Get out. That's yeah. great. Because of the slapping involved. Yeah, and, which uh, I heard you do the other night. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, he, he listed a whole bunch. I think, I think, did he say Jay Lenhart? And... And Jack Lesberg and Ron Carter and Rufus Reed are going to be the other bass players. So that's going to be a great honor. I guess so. Pay tribute to Milt. Absolutely. Yeah. Now i got to run home and learn the piece. <laughs> I hope you have good editing capabilities. <laughs> well, thanks for your time. All right. Appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks a lot to you. Thank you.